Welcome to the Seattle Investors Club podcast with Julie Clark and Joe Bauer, where we share the nuts and bolts of real estate investing from our 20 plus years in the industry. Sit back, relax, listen, and immediately take action. Are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to another edition of the Seattle Investors Club podcast, where we talk about the nuts and bolts of real estate investing. My name is Joe Bauer, and I have my co-host, Julie Clark, on the call. How are you doing today, Julie? I am good in the hood. Yeah, yeah. What's up with you? Anything new? Well, you know what? I do have something exciting going on today. In fact, thanks for asking. Tonight, like every other dork in town or some dorks, I am going to go see one of the dudes from Shark Tank. Oh, really? I love that show. I don't know. Min, do you watch it? Or he's not even on yet. Joe, do you watch show, uh, Shark Tank at all? <laughs> watch I d- it? it is one of the few shows that I ever, ever watch when I have access to cable TV. So yeah, I've watched it. I love it. I can't stand it. I, w- I watch it with the girls. But Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, is up at the Linwood Convention Center tonight. And it's actually, the topic is about real estate. So Cool. I just thought it'd be fun to go check it out. So that's what I'm going to do tonight. A little freedom, a little freedom from, uh, you know, cooking dinner and all that. So. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I am super excited today, Julie, because I have our good friend, longtime Seattle Investors Club member and just all around super guy that has a similar background to me on the podcast today, Min Q. And I'm sorry, I'm sure I'm butchering your last name, Min, but we're super excited to have you and talk about how you've gotten to where you are from, you know, being a personal trainer to being a full-time real estate investor. So welcome. How are you doing today, man? Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me. Very excited to listen to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, people, some people actually might uh, think when I said Mr. Wonderful, I was talking about men. That's what I'm thinking <laughs> because this guy is Mr. Wonderful, one of my favorite people in the whole world. That we're so proud of that is kicking a let's say kicking ass. Oh, Listen. I'm gonna have to click the button now. You Thanks, Julie. Click that button. There you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's let's uh, dive into what you're up to, man, or what you've been up to, and like get to know you a little bit. So, what were you doing before coming a full time real estate investor? Let's give us your background and how you got to where you are. Yeah, oh, I've I've been um, I just turned thirty three this year, so I've been doing uh, being a personal trainer ever since I graduated college, so almost a full decade. And um, you know, I had no real estate experience before that. Didn't know didn't know much of anything actually. So I was very passionate about fitness and uh, movement and um, you know uh, rehabilitation physical therapy and all, all that, all that stuff. I thought I was going to do that for the rest of my life, but uh, here we are. <laughs> so <laughs> as you went through that and, and, or I should say, when did you decide that that wasn't necessarily going to be your path or tell me, are you still doing some of that as a passion, but now you're in real estate? Uh, you know, at this point, um, I'm not, into it as much as I would like to, you know, obviously, um, you know, you and me both have, um, you know, a foundation understanding how important it is to, to stay healthy and stay fit. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still, you know, only two, two years into real estate and, um, I'm not as efficient as I like to be with everything I do. So, um, yeah, don't really have that much time to really dig in any further on the, on the health and fitness aspect. Just um, just working out and uh, staying as fit as possible with the time that I have. But the rest sure. is uh, full time real estate. What What was the turning point? Like, why did you switch gears? Um, no, I uh, for the Seattle market, as you get or as almost everybody knows, um, the Chinese buyers are um, very active in this market, right? So at some point, my father-in-law actually was the first one to mention something to my wife and that I should use my Chinese language abilities to maybe be an agent and get into real estate. So that's kind of my first, um, that, well, that's what gave me the first little bit of idea to maybe start looking into what real estate could do. And, uh, you know, I got, got married and, um, you know, look, look into, ha- you know, having a family and just looking into the future and, um, knowing that 
know, doing something like personal training and trading time for money is might not be the long term answer there. Was there Ooh. so it was your father in law that gave you that first spark or put the idea in your head? That's awesome. Yeah, it was him. Yeah, I actually he, um, was not expecting you to say that. So that's yeah. that's totally cool. I know we've talked about using, you know, I'm at a Chinese brokerage firm myself, um, mm-hmm. and and you know, talking about maybe you know, introducing you to that team uh, at some point as well, now that you have mm-hmm. your license. That's but right. uh, was there, what was the first, um, you know, so then you go, okay, I'm going to look into real estate. What was the very first thing? Where did you go first? Did you read a book, listen to a podcast? How did you get towards the investor side of real estate or lean that direction? Uh, you know, I went on Google and I searched uh, real estate investing. <laughs> well, um, you know, the first thing I saw was uh, bigger pockets. Yeah. Yep. And then, um, you know, just started looking the forums a little bit and um, uh, looked around and found a local meetup. And back then it was, um, I think they back then called themselves like a bigger pockets meetup, which is an uh, unofficial thing. It was a uh, Troy's meetup, right? Yep. Um, yeah. So then um, I, I went there and started meeting a few people that were actually doing it. And, um, you know, there's some people that, you know, I felt like was similar age as me and, uh, or as me and my wife, and they were actively flipping. So I thought, you know, maybe we could do something like that. Cool. Awesome. Everybody should listen to Bigger Pockets. If you guys all don't know who Bigger Pockets are, you know, who, what Bigger Pockets is, no matter where you're listening from, uh, you should check it out. Massive amounts of education, uh, you know, easy way to get started and, and uh, by listening to Bigger Pockets for, for show. So is your wife uh, involved in the business with you? Yeah, she was. Um, so, you know, as we get, get a little further down the journey here, the, our, my, our first two deals were both um, flips. So that's uh, that's what we started with. Um, I was, we're fortunate enough to have a couple of uh, real estate uh, holdings that has good amount of equity. So we took out a HELOC and uh, you know, we got into flipping. And through the first two properties here, um, my wife was more involved Um but she's uh, she's somebody that really likes stability, likes predict predictability, and um, so flipping was a uh, way too big of a stressor for her. So um, at this point, she's uh, not very involved, besides a little bit of uh, bookkeeping here and there and some uh, yeah. paying bills. We know how that goes for sure. So when you got yeah. started, did you did you go straight to I'm going to flip because you just had some available funds and. Uh, you put some hard money down or did you, did you get some hard money initially and use some of your HELOC funds to buy your first deal? Yeah, that's uh, that, that's pretty much what we did. We got a, uh, we got a hard, we got hard money and I actually took, we started looking in June and it uh, took us about a two and a half month to, to find a house to that, that penciled out. It's uh, actually very quick. You know, when you're getting started out, that's a very quick turnaround to get your first deal. So totally. see, that already, that already makes you different. <laughs> that already <laughs> puts you, where'd you get that deal? How did you, how did you get your first deal? Uh, you know, I, we, uh, we met a broker initially and uh, she took us around, you know, we, we look strictly on market and uh, you know, I was trying to network with wholesalers, but you know, if you're a new if you're a new investor, you have no no um, no track record. It's very hard to get um, any actual wholesaler, any good wholesalers front end of their um, of their deals, right? So um, so so this agent that we worked with, uh, it was it was pretty hard to find something on market and try to compete on the market, and that was over two years ago. So, um, so I know it's even harder today, but um, you know back then. Then, um, you know, at a certain point, we found a uh, investor friendly brokerage in the on the east side there. And, um, you know, they they lock up on market properties and uh, we went to their investor class and um, we were able to find one that number sounded pretty good. So I decided, you know, it's, it's time to jump in. Awesome. So did you know from the start that your goal was just to start flipping, not wholesaling? You're going to go straight to to flip was your interest? 
Yeah, I mean, that sounded a little more, actually, back then, it sounded a little more doable because uh, I wasn't, I mean, y- even though I, w- I was in the service industry and I work with people all the time, but I don't feel like I'm an extroverted person. And then the, the idea of, um, you know, talking to s- sellers directly or doing any type of um, any type of marketing, you know, I, s- I heard people talk about wholesaling and, um, you know, I didn't really n- know exactly what that is. And it's not something that I understood. So flipping was kind of the only answer. What was uh, what was your biggest fear when you were getting started? Uh, with uh, with flips, just in general, when you said I'm gonna start participating in real estate, or yeah, when you're taking your first action, you know, to move towards your first investment, what was your biggest fear aside? Obviously, probably losing all your money would be one of those. You know, uh, I knew so little when I started, you know, from the books and the forums and the people that I talked to, I felt like it was pretty simple. So I actually, actually didn't have a lot of fear. It was, um, I was, I was kind of um, I don't know, dumb, but, but blessed by that. Cause otherwise I feel like um might've never gotten started if I had too much fear. And so how did the first deal go? Tell us what happened on the first deal and you did it. You didn't have a partner. You did it on your own, right? Yep, that was just uh, me, my wife, and um, and you know the contractor was uh, you know he was you know now or after the fact we we, we found out that that was the first full rehab uh, rehab that he managed as a GC. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but he was you know he was a good guy. He didn't have his stuff together, but he was he was a good guy. So he didn't really he didn't screw us. So that was fortunate part. But you know the numbers you know. Now, now we know that, you know, a lot of times when somebody tries to sell you a property, you know, unless you're extremely efficient and experienced and have all your, um, all your crews and your numbers down, you know, most of the times the rehab numbers are going to go over budget. So, you know, we went over budget on that one. Um, and you know, we had a little bit of buffer, so we didn't, didn't lose money. We made $5,000. After, there we huh? go. See, I think that's what everybody needs to understand when they're getting started is that just, you know, you're paying for your education. Hopefully you're getting a quote free education. You made five mm-hmm. grand, you know, ho- you know, if you can go through a process and break even on your first deal without losing any money uh, and getting all that education from the hands-on experience, that's actually a win That is actually a win. I mean, I think people who think they're going to, you know, there's a new term out there. We call them luckies, right? So you got a newbie that's a newbie. They're just getting started and, you know, uh, fresh to real estate investing, kind of a common term is a newbie. But a lucky is a term that I heard a while ago. And that's where somebody's new, um, but they like knock it out of the ballpark on their first deal or their first two deals, right? And they think, oh, I got this down, right? We call them luckies because they're about to probably get a, a spanking, you know, uh, uh, with the reality of the, uh, the uh, roller coaster ride that, that this business can be. So, you know, breaking even on a deal when you first get started is actually, you know, nobody wants that, of course, right? But um, it's, it's it, you know, people are out there dropping 25 to 50,000 or more for these crazy real estate education gurus and all this stuff. Um, and you know, by doing your first deal and breaking even, you just got a free education, you know, value just as valuable or more valuable than, than all those, uh, real estate gurus, you know? So yeah, good for you for not losing money and, and doing it on your own way to go. Yeah. So what is so far now? How many how many flips have you done so far? What have you learned? What's the number one thing that's uh, surprised or different than you thought it was going to be that you now know? Um, you know, from a flipping perspective, I think um, one of the I mean, one of the big things I learned is to be patient at the start of a project and really uh, have a good game plan. Um, on exactly how much to do, right? We had that conversation on, you know, the current market and how sometimes uh, just putting some, clean up something and uh, wholetailing something is the best way to go. So really, uh, really evaluating the property and uh, know exactly what type of uh, property you have and how much you have to do to get the same, maybe the same amount of return or more versus if you did a lot of work. So just, um, just being patient and then um, also being patient throughout the project 
So I think my first couple of projects, you know, I was there every single day checking on checking on the contractors and checking on progress. But now, I mean, now just knowing you know, throughout the whole whole project, you got got to be really patient and um, know that some things are, ju- are just going to take a certain amount of time. And there's just no need for that extra stress and really stress out about if something doesn't get done the exact date that it's supposed to or as uh, originally planned. How was it getting a, co- a contractor crew on your first go round? I mean, contractors are so hard to come by these days. Um, talk about, you know, I feel like we're in our community here in Seattle, especially, and especially at Seattle Investors Club, we pride ourselves on sharing information and helping each other. But man, people don't like to give up those contractor names because, you know, they'll make referrals here and there. You need an HVAC guy or whatever, but uh, like general mm-hmm. contractors or crews, uh-uh, you know, well, people yeah. hold those pretty close to the vest. How'd you, how, you know, years, a couple years ago, maybe it was a little easier, but um, did you have trouble getting your first contractor since you ended up with the guy that was almost as new as you? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that might answer it. <laughs> yeah, no. So, so you know, getting him to come out wasn't uh, wasn't that much trouble. But before I got in contact with him, you know, you know the the way I learned how to get a, get a deal and how to get started and you know bid on a project is you know, by I was trying to do it by the book on how people recommend it. You know, getting uh, get a contractor out there before you buy the house and get a get his bid so that you know how much it's going to cost. And then, and then you put an offer in for the house. So I was trying to get somebody to go out there and do that for me before I even committed to buying the house. So um, I think that particular guy actually came from a, uh, a local hard money lender, and uh, they just gave me his name. I called him, and uh, luckily he answered the phone. That, you know, I can't say the same for a lot of the GCs out there. It's, it's really hard to get get a hold of them. Right, but um, you know, he answered answered his phone. He was able to go out there and. Um, yeah, so I mean, I th- I think that was that was pretty fortunate too. You know, he you know for for a guy that even though he was kind of new to the GC thing, but he was I mean he was a, a skilled carpenter and he you know he he was good at what he did, but he wasn't a good he wasn't good at actually managing a project and he had trouble managing. Do you still use him? Do you still use this guy today? No, I'm um, a little, little bit scared to use him now. Now, <laughs> for for what I know now, because he couldn't, uh, he had trouble managing his crew and managing his employees, and um, he actually I found out he he didn't pay a couple of people, and uh, I was lucky that they didn't they didn't leave my property. Right. So, uh, yeah. So what's yeah. the uh, so what has been your biggest challenge, or what's the biggest problem you've ever had on one of your projects so far? Um, you know, I, I would say that would be the, I think the second project. So I started my second project um, while my first project was uh, just finishing up and um, just uh, just about to get listed on the market. And, uh, you know, I thought I had a good guy for the second project. He was um, pretty reputable at that time. And he made himself very, very well known on the internet and uh, around the meetup groups in, locally. So I thought, you know, what what could what could go wrong, right? A lot of people are sort of friends with him, or I thought they were friends with him, or they have, a, you know, he had a lot of connections. So I figured, man, if this guy, if he's not what he says he is, he must be. He, he he's putting his entire reputation that he worked so hard on building up at risk, right? So, you know, he did. He was uh, so you know he he became the GC on that second project, but after the first uh, one or two months, and that project just just really didn't move and it was um, piece by piece we had uh, it, was, uh, it was very sporadic the progress and then um, you know nothing was going in order it was just uh, it was it was a nightmare so um, I mean I think the biggest challenge is to finally get rid of that guy and try to I mean we settled for well we didn't really settle he he wanted to settle with a certain amount of uh, actually another property he wanted to give me a promissory note on another property for money that he owed because I was going because I was doing draws and stuff like that but then work wasn't getting done so I think I ended up uh, about thirty thousand dollars in the hole for um for the money that I gave him wow Wow. yeah but but 
got lucky again, though. The market saved me. I think my the ARV on that project went up about seventy thousand yeah. <laughs> dollars through, through the holding time that I had. So a total of about ten months. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I bought it in the beginning of spring or the end of winter. Um, sold it in the fall. So by that time, you know, the market appreciated, and uh, you know, ended up uh, actually actually making twenty thousand dollars on that project, even after thirty thousand in the hole from uh, giving to the contractor and not getting any work done. Right. Yeah. It's so crazy. I mean, how, I mean, everything, even, you know, like contractors, it's like changing your underwear, man. You got to change them out all the time and the cost of construction and labor are going up and then people getting this lift, you know, having problems and getting a lift out of the market timing. Um, you know, like right now, probably a lot of people have been saved of, from all their problems that happened six months ago, just because of the craziness of our market. But boy, you know, if you get caught on the uh, downside or an adjustment period or a slowdown, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you really got to, you got to be paying attention to a lot of moving parts. No doubt. Um, No doubt about that. Um, So awesome. So you did you, uh, so you did the first couple by yourself and, and um, you know, going back to, um, starting to quit your day job. How many deals did you do before you started saying, you know, I might be able to, you know, quit my day job. You know, I think to me, when I think about that, I always tell people do not quit your day job. Don't just jump into it. You know, if you can, you know, some of even the most successful people, you know, in our market that are kicking butt like Christine and Olivier, I mean, she kept her job at Amazon for until they were absolutely, you know, crushing it. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, they also have a bunch of little kids and, you know, health insurance is nice to come from somebody else and all that kind of stuff. But at what point did you, did you, was it, did you think when you got started that I'm going to quit my day job or did you think I'm going to do this as a side hustle, you know, or did you even, how far forward did you think on that? Um, you know, I, I feel like in the beginning, I thought, I mean, from, just reading books and talking or, or reading forums, I feel like, you know, if you have a good GC and you, and then you buy a house here and there, then, uh, you know, they take care of everything. And I'm almost a passive investor in, uh, in the flipping, in the flipping game, you know, and, uh, that's the, probably the farthest from the truth. Flipping is very active. <laughs> <laughs> it's another day job. It's another form of a day yeah. job, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, everybody who's listening, just realize that it's another another form and a riskier form of a day job until you get really rolling with your systems and getting deals consistently and able to get a consistent crew. I mean, even as you grow, the problems still are there because you need more crew and you need more help and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, you, you, there's a lot of risk. In, in real estate, you just don't start going. I mean, um, how, did, how did you get to the point? Was it where you were consistent or you got enough money in the bank that you said, screw it, I'm just going to go for it? Or when did you make that leap? Um, you know, I have to backtrack a little bit uh, to answer that. I think, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about um, about this. So I think towards the end of my uh, first first flip, um, that's actually when I found you guys. I forgot what I was searching for, but uh, you guys uh, showed up as um, I think because I searched for something uh, regard in regards to you know, investors in Seattle. So obviously, you know, the, the name Seattle Investors Club showed up, and I think I uh, I signed up for the club and uh, got in touch with Joe a little bit, um, and I started going to the club meetings. And um, you, you know, back back then, I think that that's kind of the very beginning of uh, how I ended up to where um, where I am today with uh, you know quitting my job you know I showed up at the club and um, you know I th- a lot of people and you guys were really um, really talking about and really emphasizing like really got to do your marketing and uh, back then I didn't even know us so what do you mean by marketing what am I marketing <laughs> right and then uh, I remember you guys had the uh, I think that's when you first had the t-shirts come out that says I love marketing on the, the on the back, right? So I was like, man, I don't know what these guys are <laughs> are talking about. Why, you know, what's what's marketing? But you know, later on, I find out that's uh, marketing you know, for for sellers. 
But um, you know, that that's kind of the what, what first got in my head that I might need to start doing that because you know, looking at how how long it took for me to find my first deal, and uh, you know, if I, and I was thinking if I wanted to have something to to flip consistently, um, it's going to be very hard to find something on the market or or rely on someone else to give me a deal. You know, I have to do a lot. I have to try to you know make friends and do a lot of networking, and um, you know that, that, that's still a good thing to do. But I feel like I have to really hold my own, uh, create my own destiny, right? You really have Heck to yeah. have deal flow that I create for myself. So I think that's that's really the major turning point. So I think at, and then after I made my five thousand dollars on the uh, on the first flip, I you know I was able to kind of convince my wife you know th- this is house money now you know even though we work hard for it you know we, we got to use this money to to try to grow the business. So that's when I uh, sent out my first marketing campaign, and um, you know around the first uh, or around that same time. Um, my wife actually had a, a friend that she knew from from years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago. That um, that she's been kind of, and uh, you know, he promotes some of his stuff on Facebook, and uh, he shows some of his houses on Facebook, and um, you know, she said maybe you should go talk to him. And um, so, so I got in touch with him on on Facebook. And uh, we met up and, uh, you know, he kind of became a mentor of my from that point on. And uh, really, um, you know, when I started sending out my marketing, you know, he would be the filter for me in terms of uh, whether the sellers have um, some motivation or uh, is this a potential deal and uh, help me analyze and uh, and actually even uh, help take down some of the deals. So from that point on, you know, I started getting some returns on the, my marketing dollars. And then, um, you saw the light. Yeah. Right? So, yep. So yeah, yeah. yeah, direct mail works people. It's yeah. expensive and you got to have a skill set related to it. That's all I want to say is that direct mail still works. Um, you know, that's a big, uh, form of marketing that we certainly use, but beyond that, um, what men's talking about, which I think is a very, very, another hot topic is when somebody calls you, then what? Now you got to know, you know, not only how to analyze it and all that stuff, but you got to know how to, to talk to the sellers, um, you know, to get information out of them and to have a success. In fact, I think our meeting this coming up month, Joe at Seattle Investors Club is exactly on that topic, right? How to speak to sellers and read their personalities and closing techniques of sellers based on certain personalities. And that stuff right there is powerful, right? So you're lucky that you you found a mentor um, that was going to school you on that early on. You know, that's, uh, I mean, talk about I, I don't want to say lucky, but you, you know, you 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 had like um, three good things happen to you. You know, you got through your first deal. You know, I'm sure that guy wanted to do well by you, that contractor. If he wanted to do any more business, he doesn't sure want to screw up his first deal, or that's over for him, right? Yeah. So, um, that's all good. Yeah, let me ask you: Do you have do you have a Seattle Investors Club T-shirt? I do. Um, you do? Well, let me tell you what. It's going to become a collector's item pretty soon. <laughs> that is going to be worth some 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 special pixie dust because um, I don't know why, but can I say it, Joe? We got, yeah. we, got, we got called out on using our logo by the company that owns the images of the Space Needle. Oh. You don't even know this yet, man, but your T-shirt is a collector's item soon to oh, be. Retired, huh? Yeah, yeah. we're going to have to change our logo up a little bit. So those things wow. are going to be, for all you listening, whoever's got a Seattle Investors Club uh, T-shirt, uh, you guys hold on to that thing because it's going to become a collector's item. We have a few left, I think. Um, so if anybody wants one, we'll come up with a fun, a fun way to get one. But um, that's hilarious, yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, if you guys have any spare ones, uh, I lost about 20 or 15 to 20 pounds of muscle in the past couple of years. I think it, it doesn't matter <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to get back in the gym. Come on, let's do this. Yeah, that, you just said that to the wrong person. You're talking to Joe. You're talking to Joe Bauer. Uh, for those of you who um, know or don't know my wonderful, amazing 
partner, Joe Bauer, he has a separate blog about fitness and health and awesome recipes and all kinds of reviews of everything, all kinds of products and everything. It's called All Around Joe. So when you're done with this, go look it up, All okay. Around Joe. For all you ladies, you get to see him with his guns out and, you know, it's pretty awesome. Not bad there too. But uh, you know what's so funny is that for Christmas, Joe, what he gave me, my partner, I gave him a hammock because he loves camping and the outdoors. You know, he's about to go on this awesome trip. Um, you know what he gave me? A blood test. <laughs> That's what he gave me for Christmas. A blood <laughs> test that, you know, to like get all my readings of my stuff. So then he, I could give it to him to read. He can tell me how to be healthy and what to eat, which I, I promise Joe. <laughs> it's awesome though. I think it's so funny. It's, it's just, so it's what funny. I, it's what I give to all the people that I love, Julie. Oh, well, I love you too, brother. <laughs> Nice. We love you too, man. You know, we love you too. So, um, sorry, sidetrack there. I don't even know what we're talking about at this point. Fitness and hammocks and blood tests and a little bit of real estate mixed in. But um, so, marketing has changed your life. Taking that is that is that the message? Oh yeah, absolutely. I won't. I don't think I would have a business if I didn't start marketing. I mean, right now, I you know, I flip houses we got you know five six projects going but i still have to say that i have a marketing business not a flipping business because uh, that's that's the number one priority because i mean i can find the money i can find buyers i can find contractors that would do the work at this point with the, all the resources that i have but um you know finding the sellers finding the deals is uh, the the lifeblood Heck yeah. So for everybody who's getting started or who's, you know, having a slow start, if you want to pick up the pace, you better start doing your own marketing, take control of your own situation, your own business. If you don't have a lot of money to do that, direct mail does cost money. It doesn't have to be expensive. You know, it, it needs to be consistent. So mail the same list over and over and over again, you know, like 10 times or more, Rather, you know, add on some 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 extra here or there, but you're better better off mailing the same list over and over again. And if you run out of money, guess what? It's springtime, everybody. At least it is right now. Um, hit the streets, do some door knocking. You want to talk about some good education and some, you know, throw you into the wolves. You know, um, you know, join Seattle Investors Club where we record all our meetings and learn about how to talk to sellers and hit the streets. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to do it myself. I'm, I mean, I think it's just good to stay out there and, you know, be out in the, uh, you know, boots on the ground and all that stuff, keep everything fresh and real. And, um, you know, what a great way to get deals. So marketing. It's a great time to be out there actually right now. Um, you know, weather just started to get warmer, warmer. And uh, this is when the grasses really start growing. That's right. This is when all the moss shows up real nice on the roofs. You know, you, if there's still moss on the roofs, you know, you got to knock on that door and, yeah. uh, you know, me and buddy, we're going to hit the streets, <laughs> right? <laughs> we're going to hit the streets, me and the bud man. That's right. So I don't know if you can walk your cat. You know, I've seen all kinds of crazy people these days walk their cat. You could throw, you have a cat. What's your cat's name, Min? Zoe. Zoe, yeah. Zoe the cat. Zoe cat the cat and Buddy the dog. That's part of our, you know, maybe maybe you'll knock on a door. Maybe you can find some, some forum about people who love cats. <laughs> it's a marketing strategy, right? You can find That's out, you know, strategy. And then you can like take a picture of you and Zoe on a postcard or, or some Facebook ad and directly target cat lovers. There's my, my ninja marketing tip for you. Got to do something different, right? That's not a bad idea. You know, my first ever post, <laughs> I put my, um, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. I actually put, I, um, I went on Fiverr and I had somebody design a postcard with my cat on it. And uh, that's the first one I sent out. <laughs> really? Did it work? Uh, I got one lead. Well, try putting like a mustache on your cat, see or something like that. <laughs> see if that see if that does anything. One of one of our buddies, like um, uh, Arive, I think is doing it right. Is he rapping about real estate? Yeah. On Instagram, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
I yeah, just, I love the creativity. Sometimes you gotta, you know, have fun, right? With this sort of thing too. And it's not all serious all the time. The last thing we want is to be serious all the time, <laughs> right? So, well, let's go back to, so you started marketing, you started getting some traction and some consistent leads. And now you're thinking, oh my God, I might be able to quit my day job. Lay it on us. Yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't really, uh, you know, I figure I go, I'll go part time. Actually, I, I turned part time before I quit full time. But um, you know, it's really at a point where it took it took a while to really be. Uh, I mean, I bought into that. I needed to market, but it took a while to really believe that it's always going to come. Even though I was doing marketing consistently and uh, you know, getting getting a, a you know, steady lead flow, but it's just um, you know, I, I I don't come from a business background, so it's really something something like this is really hard to. Um, uh, it's it's not not a belief, but it's really hard to to really put your put your put your livelihood on but um you know at some point pretty much i I just made sure that made enough income or have enough put aside that i can um that i have at least enough for a one year's uh, living expenses and at least one year of marketing expenses and right then i started to feel a little more relaxed and then um actually the turning point for me actually quitting or it was actually um, when I had when I got written up for my for my low numbers at work. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So you know, by that day, you know, my manager was gonna give me the was gonna write me up, was gonna give me the the notice that I need to pick it up, and I told him, oh, actually, I'll I'll just put in my two weeks. Wow. <laughs> but when you walked out that day, were you nervous as hell, or were you like, oh yeah? Oh, I was, I was relieved because um, I mean I thought about it for a while, but um, you know, be, being there for ten years, I've I've had some wow. clients that I've had for you know over nine years. So it's a very it's, it's it's difficult to you know to to leave somebody, and a lot of those clients are are older older folks that uh, you know I feel like I really had to take care of them. So it's, so that part of it was very difficult. Um, but that that's the only thing. Yeah, though. but now they can be your uh, private money investors, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. They um, <laughs> actually have a, had a client that's a real estate investor, and I uh, had you know a couple others that made um, <laughs> invest in different assets. And uh, yeah, that could that, that's definitely something that uh, we talked about. Well, one of the one of the main points I like to circle up and point out to everybody as we have these discussions, he said something pretty significant. He said that he has a year of his living expenses set aside, right? Most people might say, um, yeah, that sounds good. But the other thing, the most important thing he said is he has a year of his marketing expenses ready to go and set aside. That right there, if anybody is listening to this, is probably the most significant thing that Min has shared with us today. He didn't just save for his living expenses. He saved for his marketing expenses. So he knows he's going to be able to stay consistent in control of his own business. And the other thing I'll say is, um, you know, uh, believing in the process Direct mail marketing can have good months, bad months. Um, You know, you need to be consistent and you need to essentially push through the pain to put it back in the context of terms you two workout dudes might understand, right? Let's put it, you know, push through the pain because it's it's a, um, a painful thing sometimes if you send out a piece of mail, uh, you know, and it doesn't get the response rate that you're expecting. I mean, that happens to us all every year. You know, yep. even, I don't know why it seems to happen around February. I don't know why. <laughs> January, but February yeah. gets us. You know, but uh, <laughs> for some reason we, it, it, you know, I think it's just people, especially this year in 2018, we're really slow to make decisions. I think might have been, you know, tax reform changes. People were confused about mm-hmm. what that meant for them. And there was a little bit of that going on. But pushing through and believing, you have to understand that consistency and marketing is the pathway to success. You know, you got to just you got to just push through the bad months and keep going and have the faith um, in the process. Um, I think that's what Min just shared with us. We can share that from our our own experience with our own investment company. Um, you know. Yep. 
That is all good stuff. Well, awesome. So what's your, uh, what's your goals now? What's your next step in the chapter of men, the book of men? I like that. The book of men. Maybe we should <laughs> call this podcast, the book of men. It reminds me of the life of Pi, or so, you know, that book, it's a famous book. Mm-hmm. You're going to be famous after this men. So what's up? What are you, what's up? What's next for you? Oh man, uh, I think uh, I, don't, I don't know if I told Joe, but Julie, you know we have uh, we have our first child on the way. Woo! Ooh, yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. breaker news, breaking news right there, and congratulations yeah. on that yeah. once again. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. So knowing knowing that, you know, I think the next step for me, I really I feel like I really have to hire somebody that could help with uh, some of the some of the tasks. Um, some of the stuff that are um, I really have to write out exactly what happens in the business and really um, be able to delegate part of it at least you know 20 to 30 hours of it in a week so just document your processes right exactly or you know video if you can do like a video so you don't have to train people over and over and over again about how to do something in a video that you can just make them watch right that might be a yep. good ninja modern way to do that. You know, we could probably do yeah. more of that ourselves for sure. Before Joe yells at me, I'll just yell at myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. Uh, I mean, I've done some some of that stuff with VAs on um, you know overseas and you know, recording screencasts and stuff like that. But um, I think some of the stuff it's a lot better to train someone locally, and and uh, you're able to you're able to meet and really a l- little better control of the process and um, just really knowing the person. I think is important. Is there anything you would have done differently on this journey that you've had so far now that you have hindsight? Is there anything you would have done sooner or not done at all or wish you would have supersized or any of that stuff? Oh, man, you know, um, you know, I was thinking about that and it really, uh, I think, uh, you know, I was pretty, pretty fortunate in that, you know, I've learned through mistakes, but, but my mistakes didn't, didn't kill me. So, you know, I think some of the mistakes are actually are important in the process. So I really, um, Agreed. Yeah. yeah, really, really wouldn't give much. I mean, maybe besides listening to my gut a little bit with my, uh, with my second project. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I tell some, some people this story, me and, uh, me and the guy that ended up, you know, taking the $30,000 from me, he, he would go out and look at some houses with me and, um, you know, he, he didn't even, he didn't know how to lay tape on the floor to measure a room. So, <laughs> so I was like, and, uh, you know, at that time I, I thought some, something is wrong, but then, you know, he, he had a, a construction degree. So I thought well, maybe he's just, just all books. So, you know, that, that's kind of, but maybe just vetting somebody a, a little bit better and maybe listen to my gut and really, uh, you know, stick with it and make a decision based on that instead of, uh, you know, maybe worrying about or thinking about what other people might be uh, or having other people filter for me, I guess. Right. You know, another good point, and we'll, we'll point this out again. We did a podcast topic on this recently. What do we call it, Joe? We called it uh, who's responsible for a bad deal or something like that. It should be a podcast coming to you, to you soon from Seattle Investors Club topic. But, um, you know, everybody needs to know when they're getting started that the, you know, the only one responsible for a bad deal is yourself. You are responsible. You, you listen to people. You see they have a bunch of friends and followers. They go to meetups. They go to, you know, uh, they've done some deals. They throw some stuff out on Facebook. Um, but, you know, remember, when somebody's trying to sell you something or you're going to be giving them money, um, they're going to do whatever they need to do to get that money. They're going to sell you. They're going to make it sound good. They're going to make it sound like they have all the skills. Just remember and go look for our podcast on that topic because we won't dive into it today, but you are responsible. If you're going to one of these auction groups or you know, uh, getting deals from wholesalers, remember, they're there to sell you something. Do not fall hook, line, and sinker for all their information. Do your homework, take responsibility. And as I say, you know, Min was lucky early on also to, to 
have a great mentor as well. And if you're somebody that's rolling on your own, um, you might want to, of course, get connected with your local real estate investment club, wherever you're at. If you're in the Seattle area, please come join us, you know, at the Seattle Investors Club. You can look online. We meet the second Saturday of every month in Renton at the Renton Technical College. But go find somebody um, to m mentor you. They don't have to be like extremely experienced, but if they have five, six deals under their belt, you know, that's a lot of lessons they've learned right there, you know that, uh, you know, partner up. You don't have to go it alone. You don't have to start a company with anybody, but just know that you're responsible and you should question everything and you should ask for referrals. If a, you know, a auction group gives you or a wholesaler gives you some contractors, that doesn't mean they're good contractors. That also doesn't mean they're going to be available when you need them. That's another little tip, right? Here's right. a list okay, I'll close on my deal. I'll call these guys. What? You're not available for a month? You know? I mean, you guys got to, you know, do your own homework and we'll cover more podcast topics on tips to um, maybe the first 10 or 20 questions that you should ask on any deal. That might be a good one. We haven't done something like that. But, um, you know, awesome men. You're one of our heroes. You're one of our, uh, you know, long-term club members that we respect and we have enjoyed watching come up in the ranks. Uh, you know, the world is your oyster. Now you, you know, enough of enough of the secret ninja things and stuff under your belt. We know you're going to crush it and, and you're going to also crush it because you're a great person. You're an honest guy. And, um, you know, we love, uh, surrounding ourselves with, with people like you. So, we know you're looking for more deals. Um, you're always looking for deals. How can everybody send you deals or what's your criteria? Where are you looking? You looking in certain counties or anywhere? Uh, you know, at this, uh, at this point in the market, um, the, the stuff that we take down and buy are mostly going to be um, in northern King County. So, you know, Shoreline, Lake Forest Park, Kenmore, Bothell and then south of Snohomish County we have a lot of projects in Mount Lake Terrace, Linwood, um, uh, well, Mill, Mill Creek, um, some of the Seattle Hill areas so um, yeah so th those are the main areas and um, you know I don't have any specific criteria on the deals you know a lot of people talk about percentages and stuff like that but we just evaluate based on how much work it is and what, what type of, um, what season we're in, what month we're in and, uh, when potentially we might be selling and then, um, and just looking at exactly how much, uh, how much the house needs and uh, we'll, we'll base that and then we'll base our, um, the amount of profit we're hoping to, hoping to make based off of that. Um, yep. where can people reach you if they want to send you some deals because you're such a stud? Uh, they can reach me at uh, actually. So I just joined um, Fresh Look Real Estate in Bellevue. So you can yep. reach me at min at freshlookre.com. Well, let's touch on that. So you got your real estate license recently, right? That's right. The golden key is what I call it. <laughs> everybody on every team should have somebody that has a real estate license. Why, why did you get your real estate license or when did you clue in that maybe that might be something you need to add into your tool belt? Well, you know, this is, <laughs> this is similar to the marketing. You know, I, I hear, you, hear you talk about it enough and I feel like I really, that's something I need to do. And, uh, you know, just, just hearing the, <laughs> hearing the benefits of, um, what that, um, I guess it, it, it provides me uh, or gives me the option or uh, gives me the, the ability to offer the sellers more options just based on having the license. And, and um, it's, it's just another tool in the tool belt that I can make an income. Do you feel that it has gotten in your way with wholesaling at all or picking up deals or talking to sellers? Has it been a positive or a negative do you, you know, I always say it's a big myth that sellers don't want to talk to realtors. It's all how you present yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, you walk in the door saying, hey, I, I can provide you options. To me, that's, that is like such a stellar way to, you know, be able to service people. Have you found that it's gotten in your way at all or just been mainly a positive for you? Um, you know, I've, there's been I, I can there, there's been I would say at least more than a handful of times that I've had somebody that's um, that I 
feel like I could definitely pitch the listing uh, part of things to them and offer that, that option. And uh, I feel like, you know, if I don't represent, since I didn't have my license and I couldn't represent myself or my company as uh, also be able to list properties and having a license, um, you know, even though we offer to refer them to a different broker, they didn't feel like, you know, they felt connected to us. They felt connected to me. Right. Marketing, right. They, so they didn't really, uh, they, they weren't as open to the idea of a referral. They feel like they can just either, they can find their own referrals through their own network. Right. So I feel like th- those are some missed opportunities. Um, you know, and I feel like a lot, a lot, a lot of times, you know, if the seller is hung up on a certain price and stuff like that, I feel like I can use, use my um, having the having a license. I can use that to help them, uh, you know, look at it from a broker's perspective and uh, help right. them analyze, yeah, as a as maybe from a retail um, uh, run numbers in, in the, on the on the retail side and um, and. I mean, and, think about how much money you spend on marketing, and if you had to throw away all those leads you know, where you could have converted them to a listing or you could have, you know, even if you refer, you know, even if you tell them that you're going to be involved and you're going to be the broker, it's so easy to partner with another broker and co-list something, let them run the show and have a split so you can stay in control of that referral. Like you said, like if they like you, they want to stay with you, they want to work with you. But let's say you don't want to be the one that does the listing and acts like the agent. I mean, it's so easy then to just co-list with somebody that handles that side of it. Right. Right. And you, and they still believe that you're in the mix and you are still in the mix, but it's that comfort transition. Right. I just, uh, I just think that, you know, wholesalers today, I just think there's a ton of myths out there on um, why people don't get their license. So we're going to see at Seattle Investors Club, we can bust that wide open and thank you for, for uh, being um, one of my pigeons on that respect as well. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you guys giving all the all the tips to help uh, help me. Be, help. Oh, is that a dog? No, that was my chair. That was my. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you guys. Your next thing you were going to go to SeattleInvestorsClub.com. You'll see a big picture of Min as the poster child for Seattle Investors Club with all his successes. So we. We really appreciate you talking to us today. And um, you know what the awesome part is, is now, now you have enough experience. You can actually teach us, you know, we, we share and we teach and educate, um, you know, whoever wants to listen. And the good part is, is people like you go through, you know, their changes and, and, and do uh, more and more in their business. Now you turn around, you're able to educate uh, us and uh, all the other people that uh, are in our community whether that's in Seattle or anywhere else. So thank you again so much for coming on and having a chat with us today. And that's all I got because now Buddy is looking at me. Um, I actually had to switch into a different room because my cat's up. (laughs) (laughs) Dang, man. These animals, they control our lives and we love them. Right on. Right on. Well, we hope to see you uh, at the upcoming meeting here in a couple of weeks at Seattle Investors Club, Men. And um, in the meantime, send your deals to Men, guys, if you know, um, or I'm sure he's available. If you have any questions on getting ready to quit your day job, he can probably help you with that too. So that's yep. all I got. Yeah, Men, what was that email again one more time if people have deals for you? Uh, it's just Men, M I N, at freshlookre.com. Cool. Thank you, sir. And if anybody wants to get to the show notes, they are, are at seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 31. That's seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 31. And if you like this podcast, we would love it if you would head over to iTunes and give us a review because every review that we get definitely helps us to get our voices out there. And you can find our iTunes channel by searching for Seattle Investors Club or going to seattleinvestorsclub.com slash iTunes. All right, guys. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks for being on. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate all you do. I appreciate you. Later, guys. Over and out. Thanks for listening to the Seattle Investors Club podcast. If you have questions that you'd like to have answered on the show, shoot us an email at info at seattleinvestorsclub.com. Now go out, take that action, and build that real estate business. Thanks for listening.